Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Joe Elbaum, Executive Director of Congregation Emmanuel. Prior to joining Congregation Emmanuel in 2008, Joe Elbaum was the Executive Director at Congregation Rodaf Shalom in New York City and an executive at IBM where he held various positions in manufacturing, technical services, sales, and finance over a 30-year career. Congregation Emmanuel has a distinguished history serving the Jewish community in San Francisco and participating in the reform movement nationally since its founding in 1850. In the past years, the congregation has grown from 1,500 to over 2,500 families. Joe has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Joe, for taking the time to join with us today. You're welcome, and my pleasure. So let's set the stage a bit by describing Congregation Emmanuel and, and the scope of its operations, and, and if you could give us a little bit of information on the history of the congregation as well, which is, which is quite fascinating. Sure. Let's, let's start with the history. As you mentioned, uh, it has been in existence since 1850. It is uh, really started with the uh, gold rush era. Uh, it, it, uh, it was begun by Jewish merchants who, who came to San Francisco and determined that they could uh, make a very good living by providing the supplies that, that miners needed, uh, not only clothing, but uh, uh, I've seen articles about the, uh, the equipment, the pickaxes, and, and, and just general merchandise. Um, the congregation, um, uh, ba based on, on my understanding, and, and, and again, I'm here only, only about 16 months in, in this job, but I, I have found it fascinating that there are uh, at least a half a dozen founding families that are still in the congregation. Oh, really? It, is, it, it makes it very interesting to, to, to see how they, the families have, have grown over the years and remain members. Uh, and, and, and it is one of the things that drew me to San Francisco in, in terms of it being a, uh, a lively city, um, a, a city with, uh, with, with many things to offer, much like New York City where I came from, but on a much smaller scale. Um, it, it is uh, geographically, uh, as, as many people know, uh, um, only about seven miles by seven miles. And uh, it, it, it is incredible in terms of the culture and what you see in that city during that time period. But just getting back to, to the history, Congregation Emanuel has done very well over the years. Um, and as you described, grew extensively in, in, uh, in, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I believe because uh, of, of, of what the temple offers in terms of uh, social justice, um, uh, opportunities for people to volunteer and do things that are very meaningful in a city such as San Francisco, where uh, social reform is very important. And the congregation is, is uh, if I recall properly, the fifth largest uh, congregation in the United States in the reform yes. movement? It, it is probably certainly in the, in, in the top five. There's uh, uh, Congregation Emanuel actually in New York City is, right. is, is, is the largest with about 300,000 members. Um, and then there are, there are congregations in, uh, believe it or not, Detroit uh, and uh, Dallas and Chicago that, that are in that range. And there is a very large congregation in uh, um, Los Angeles as well. Now, I, I also understand, uh, and, and tell me if this is, if this is true, that, that the film, The Frisco Kid with Gene Wilder and uh, what was in favorites. part yes. uh, based on, on the, the journey of the rabbi to come and actually lead the congregation all those years ago? Uh, people often relate the two, yes, that, uh, that, that that rabbi was coming to San Francisco to start a congregation. Uh, it, it, it is interesting because the reform movement really was the first movement uh, uh, to provide education and actually ordain rabbis uh, out of their uh, uh, education center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you get from having a 30-year career at IBM um, to then decide to make this, this monumental transition um, you spent, after a 30-year career at IBM, eight years in Rodolf Shalom, then you came over to San Francisco. How did that transition happen? Uh, all throughout my, my IBM career, um, I, I made a decision very early that, first of all, I wanted to get management skills. And, and one of the reasons I selected the IBM uh, Corporation to work for, I felt they had outstanding management training uh, coming, out of, uh, coming, coming out of college. Um, and I knew very early that I wanted to get a broad range of, of, of experiences and not just focus, for example, in the technical side of programming or program development um, or design or software. Um, 
I, I decidedly made changes roughly every two to five years uh, to learn something different and, and, and keep, uh, keep the job exciting. Um, and you had a range of different responsibilities at IBM. I mean, it, from, from engineering services to uh, programming to uh, you, you were involved in the sales uh, operation, in, the fi in financial management. Exactly. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I started in manufacturing, went into sales, and spent the greatest amount of, of time in sales, um, and, and actually had an opportunity while in sales to go into education and manage an education center, which is certainly very different than sales, and then come, come back and, and do things in, uh, in software development, um, financial management, as, as you uh, expressed, um, and then ultimately administrative uh, support management. And that was really the technical side of, of how, to, uh, how to manage the administrative operations, all the order taking for IBM uh, in, uh, in the final stages of, of my career. Um, as I approached the 30-year the uh, point in my career, um, I, I was looking around and deciding, did I really want to go out and become a CIO type individual uh, in one of these dot-com industries in early 1999 and, and 2000 when things were going very, very well. And um, uh, I, I then reflected on and said, I really want to do something that is very different. Because you made the actual transition from IBM when the, the dot-com era, the, the, the internet boom and so on was absorbing uh, people out of organizations like IBM at a exactly. tremendous pace. Yes. Uh, there was, it was, there, there were, were a lot of enticements. Yes, there were, there were outstanding opportunities in that area, but I felt in, in, in the last 10 or 15 years of my career, um, I wanted to do something very different than I had ever done before. Why not take on different, different challenges? And I, I am a creature of change. I do like change. When you, when you look at my, my, my growing up, I went to five high schools, okay? I went to, to three um, elementary schools, um, and either you, you become stronger and you grow from that, or it becomes a problem. And, and I determined that every time I made a change was an opportunity for me to reinvent myself, to be who I wanted to be, and look back and say, um, this didn't work for me, let me do it the, this so other way. So you can way. become an individual with complexes or a complex individual? Very well put, very well put. <laughs> um, so going, going back and looking at uh, uh, what I wanted to do, um, in the last few years at IBM, I, I actually joined a, uh, a not-for-profit board of uh, Regional uh, Hospice of Western Connecticut, and they were looking how to, how to refine their organization, their structure, something I had a good deal of experience with uh, in IBM. I actually ran a number of planning sessions for them um, as a member of their board. Um, in addition, uh, I, at, at the same time, I was a member of a congregation in Danbury, Connecticut, um, and had taken it upon myself, certainly through my wife's urging, who, who be, actually became president of the congregation, and uh, I uh, uh, served as chair of finance committee, the HR committee. So the president uh, roped, you, roped you roped into the... In. Uh... Although it certainly gave me an opportunity to understand how a different type of not-for-profit functioned, um, and certainly very, very different in dealing with, uh, with, with, with a hospice where I don't have the skills that, that a nursing staff would have, but on the other hand, in going to a temple, again, I don't have the skills that a clergy staff would have, yet administratively, I could provide them with a, with a good deal of help, direction, and support. You, you are at IBM, you're learning about the nonprofit sector, uh, you're actually contrasting the, 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 some of the management challenges and the board challenges also. Exactly. Between your, your business uh, life and your nonprofit life. And there must have been some uh, sense that this is, the, this is the place you would wish to make your next contribution. That must have evolved. How did that, how did that happen? Perhaps it was fate, but they, a job came up in New York City, the Road of Shalom job, um, which piqued my interest. Um, I looked at it and said, I don't have necessarily the experience to work in that environment, but I certainly have the skills. The larger the organization, the not-for-profit in terms of number of staff, the better my skills would fit because my skills were management, my skills were organizational structure, um, I had, had done a good deal of delegation and setting up new departments in, in IBM as well. And not-for-profits tend to have a considerable amount of turnover. 
certainly at the administrative support levels, uh, not as much at, at, at the higher levels, but there's, there's regular turnover that takes place, and that was something that I felt uh, I had the skills to manage uh, and, and, uh, and, and use the experiences that I had. And in, in coming in to speak with the uh, board members of Road of Shalom as you were, as you were considering um, the opportunity as, as they were trying to recruit su uh, a new leader, um, they must have also been quite impressed by the fact that you had spent considerable time working in nonprofit environments. You had gained some insight and some respect for the professionalism sure. that, that the organizations. Well, there, there was, interesting enough, there was another factor that just came to mind. When I made the decision to, to decide where to go, um, there was a course being offered on synagogue management in New York City. Uh, and it was a, an 18 week course and I, I decided to invest my time and, and then actually take it to determine what kind of match I had in, in, in terms of skills and then I could actually t converse with the, the instructor and say based on the questions I'm asking and the answers that I'm giving does it seem to be a reasonable fit so I had another uh, means of measurement to say um, it's a good fit and it, and it is very difficult to make the transition uh, predominantly because in, in the corporate world I was accustomed to making decisions and being able to implement them very quickly. Um, not the case in the not-for-profit world. Although the decision can be made quickly, the implementation takes far longer when you're convincing a board of 10, 15, maybe even 20 uh, board members and a clergy staff uh, and, and in many cases some congregants, some influential congregants. And, and, and that was part of the, the interview process at Road of Shalom. Could I make those changes? Could I make that uh, adaptation? And you don't have the, the uh, single-mindedness of a corporation where you really are looking at your quarterly bottom line results and your annual bottom line results. Um, everything that you do at a congregation or at a hospice or at, or at another organization is going to shift uh, some of the calculus. It's going to shift how people are treated it's going to shift some of your programs. You might be shifting some of your programmatic emphasis. If you're focusing on, just, on social justice, you may be focusing in a different area than you had previously. You'll be affecting different people's lives in so many different ways. And it isn't just about, is this product going to generate more margin than that product? Exactly. Or, or can we cut costs in this yeah. particular way? In, in dealing with, with, with clergy staff, uh, we'll go through this briefly, what, what a, a, a temple is involved in. I would break it into you know, worship, education, and community. Um, I think it's a good way to look at it. Um, and the worship side is something I certainly don't deal with. I need to provide the financial support to do what, 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 what the worship piece is. Something very, very interesting, which, which is a question that I had for myself when I, when I took this job is, do I have the financial skills to do the job? And coming through a career where I was predominantly an engineer uh, and a manager, um, al although I, I always had to deal with budgets, um, I had to force myself to learn that part and get more involved in budgets. That, so that was a conscious decision that someone who, who doesn't tend to want to do uh, financial management um, is, is something you have to add to your portfolio if you're going to do something down the now line. Now that's interesting to hear you now say that, that part of what you were trying to do was to uh, shift your competence um, yeah. in this area, and you had some doubts uh, yourself. Okay. Do you find the nonprofit world to be uh, challenging in terms of, of the competence required to appropriately manage um, a, a complex nonprofit? What, what makes it so, so different, in, and you mentioned it earlier, is you're not, you're not building budgets for the bottom line, okay? You're building budgets to, to, for programming, for worship, and for education. Uh, and you sometimes have to trade off staff size, and, and, and sometimes you have to trade off some programming if you can't get grants or funding to, uh, to supplement the, the normal revenue. And, and what, what I think we're finding in nonprofits today is more and more revenue, certainly in, in, in temples, are coming from things other than dues or membership dues. And, and therefore, the challenge is to do more fund development or fundraising um, and to identify more grants um, and, and to establish endowments. Um, this is not simply an approach in which people are going to give you charity. You're actually providing services that Absolutely. if they were, were provided in, in a private context, uh, would cost substantial sums, and in fact would probably cost uh, quite a bit more than in a nonprofit uh, context. So 
for example, education. That's, in a sense, you are, you're providing a service for a fee. Um, it's just that it happens to be a very modest fee because what you're trying to do is to make ends meet and not, not necessarily right. cover generate. very basic costs, heat, electricity, security. I, I was accustomed to identifying a plan or program that would generate either a cost saving or a profit, build the, the, the budget to do it, present it, and uh, get the go ahead or go back and refine it. And, and that is not what I, I, I do in the, uh, the not-for-profit world. And here it's a negotiation about how people's lives are going to be transformed uh, through their various investments sure. in, in programs, whether it's an elder program or a program for, for kids. This is all part of the, uh, of the living and breathing of the community itself. And that's part of the reason why there's so much negotiation involved. Exactly. So when you came to Road of Shalom, um, what was the size of, of their budget and, and the size of their operation, and how was it transformed when you left? And then, and then let's chat a little bit about uh, Congregation Emmanuel. Road of Shalom, in comparison, was a, uh, a, a temple of, of roughly 17 to 1,800 members. Um, what made it unique uh, is it had a Jewish day school, uh, of which there, in the Reform Movement, there are only 19 across the country. It was an important part of who Road of Shalom was. So the temple was, was very, I wouldn't use the word dependent, but it needed the school to draw new members and, and members who stayed uh, after their children went on to the, to the upper grades were, were not only committed members, but they generally uh, did very well in leadership. As a matter of fact, I, I looked at, at the, the, the precedents over the, over the prior, let's say, 20 years that, that I uh, joined the temple, and uh, the majority of them came from the preschool or were preschool parents. So it, it speaks very highly of, of that whole process. Um, the challenge I had, just to, to get back to your question, when, uh, uh, when I joined Road of Shalom was improving the relationship between the, the, uh, the day school and, and the temple because it, the day school was growing at its own rate, felt it wanted to be somewhat more independent of the temple, but the, 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 the day school was part of the temple and had to remain as such. Um, and so it was, it was a management challenge to do that. Uh, and one of the main reasons, uh, I believe, that uh, um, the board decided to take a risk and bring someone in who had corporate experience and little if no um, not-for-profit experience. And uh, the challenge in a fundraising or capital campaign such as that is when you go out to the parents of, of, of day school children, um, obviously they are most interested in, in the benefit to the day school. Um, and when you approach the, the temple members who do not have children, they're interested in what is this capital campaign going to do for the temple. Right. Okay, so that was a, an ongoing challenge. Uh, it, was, it was managed well. The, uh, um, the leadership did a, did a fine job in pursuing it. And again, it was done in a time period when the economy was tough, back in uh, uh, 2000 to 2004. Um, but it was successful. Um, and it helped bring the, the, the day school and the temple uh, community closer together when it, when it was done. So it served that purpose as well. You had a uh, budget of $9 million for the synagogue. Right. And um, a $29 million budget for the day school. So you were managing an organization that was almost a 40, uh, $40 million yeah. annual yeah. operating. And your decision to move across the country to San Francisco, was this just a, a new chapter? Had you gotten to the point where you felt that, that your work was done at Rodolf Shalom? Well, if, if, you look at, if you look at my career at, at IBM, uh, I, re I really never stayed in a job more than five years. So this was an eight-year period. Uh, and you're aware I was called numerous times uh, to, to, to uh, uh, consider the job in San Francisco. And it, it reached a point where I said, you know, it is the right thing to do for me at this time. <laughs> I'm interested in a new challenge, a new change, um, and I want to start again. I, I think it, it, it keeps you invigorated, uh, it keeps you active, uh, and it's healthy. And so you came in to, to Congregation Emmanuel. Now that was another very interesting situation. You had a leader who had, who had been there for a very long tenure. Had you, shaped, roughly 17 years. 17 years, had shaped the internals of the organization. Um, there was a certain operating culture. Yeah. Um, San Francisco is, is not like New York. It's, it's culturally a very distinct place. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you found and, and... So, what I stepped into was an environment where not only had, had a, another leader been there for 17 years, um, but he had been out of the job for 
roughly 18 months. Right. The responsibilities were split basically between, between two senior staff members. Um, and my first job was to, to gain their trust and confidence um, and gradually take things away from them. And the approach to the job is no different than I had done in, in 30 years at, at IBM. I, I literally sat with every member of the staff one-on-one -on -one for at least half an hour and spoke to them uh, about their job, what interested them, what did not interest them, gave them an opportunity to know who I was and for me to get to know them. So you began to reshape the organization now around the people. Have you uh, evolved the, the, the staff in any uh, particular way? Yes, I have changed the staff somewhat. It's been a gradual process uh, as I anticipated. Um, I, I am currently uh, uh, working on a, on a new organizational structure which I expect to, to reach in phases. I know what the staff needs to look like. Uh, it is very difficult in the not-for-profit environment to take people who've been in jobs 10, 15, and 20 years and say, you're no longer doing this, you're not doing this other thing. In many cases, they don't have the skills or they need time to develop uh, the skills. Um, but that, is, that process is, is underway. Um, and I, I found also an environment where there were many um, part-time people and try, have, have tried to make jobs more full and ensure that we had full-time jobs and very few part-time jobs. Um, it is more difficult to manage part-time employees, clearly, especially if, if they're not always working on site. I look at my job as, as ensuring that the operation is running smoothly from an administrative support standpoint, um, that all of the, uh, the needs of the clergy in terms of setups, uh, in, in terms of uh, the expense to run the programs they need are in place. And this was a difference between the two temples as well. I do get more involved in, in setting programming for the clergy and, and helping the clergy manage uh, their staff, their administrative staff, uh, than I did at Road of Shalom. It is just a different metric or a different way or approach to the job. Well, the congregation is, is very strong, and um, this has been a, a very uh, interesting transition from a 17-year tenure to reaching out across the nation and, and finding somebody in a completely different city uh, with a completely different background. And, and your wife is also very involved in the community as uh, well. A absolutely. So let me, let me ad address some of that. Um, what, what I wanted to make sure occurred as I transitioned to the job and got more, uh, more involved was a feeling that I was not bringing a corporate culture. Um, clearly anyone with my background, if something, if something becomes very organized and structured in a not-for-profit environment, you do hear the word you're making our, our, our environment more corporate. Um, I like to think of, of, of having a corporate mentality without a corporate lack of sensitivity. Okay. And, and that's how I approach the job. What does a corporate mentality mean? It means you know, formalizing, uh, let's say, employee reviews, something that is not often done in the not-for-profit world, but it makes managing the staff much easier if there are regular reviews each year and everybody has a job description. It is very difficult to ask someone to do something or change if they haven't been told they, they were doing something wrong. So that is part of the, uh, the corporate mentality that, that I have brought to both jobs. Um, and and I, think, I, I think it has worked. Um, I do it in, in a kind of soft sell manner though, as opposed to this is drop everything, we're no longer doing it this way, we are now doing it this other way. Um, it, generally things need to be phased in as opposed to implemented. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today and uh, for sharing your experiences in your business uh, career, in your nonprofit career, and, and with uh, Congregation Emmanuel. You're welcome. Thank you, Joe. My pleasure. Thank you for your insights.